Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Frontline Club. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, before I hand over to uh, Richard Lapper, who's going to chair tonight's discussion, if I can just ask you to switch your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we are broadcasting live this evening. Over to Richard. Yeah, um, welcome. Nice to see so many faces here tonight um, for this session on uh, the record and legacy of uh, Hugo Chavez. Um, it's obviously a very appropriate time to be having this discussion, um, given the health of uh, President Chavez. Uh, and um, we'll see in a little while whether we think this is coming towards the end of his 13 years in, uh, in office. Um, now, to, to discuss these issues, these broader issues, the longer-term legacy, uh, the record in office of President Chavez, we've got three speakers, all of whom who know Venezuela very well. Um, Rory Carroll is Guardian correspondent currently in Los Angeles. He was in Caracas for six years, from 2006 to, I think, 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, and his book, Commandante, um, is, has been, just been published, right? By, uh, uh, next week. Next week by Canningate. Um, John Lee Anderson is a staff writer at The New Yorker, um, a frequent visitor to dangerous places, most recently to Mali. Uh, he's the author of, I suppose, what's become now a standard biography of Che Guevara. And his most recent piece on Venezuela uh, is a, an essay called Slumlord, published on the 28th of January of this year. Um, and finally, we've got Diego Moya Ocampos, who's a Venezuelan political scientist who's analyzes Latin America uh, for the IHS, political consultancy, here in London. Um, Diego knows Chavismo both from the inside and as an opponent of uh, the Chavista government. He was advisor to the Attorney General of Venezuela in the year of 2000, right at the beginning of the Chavista period. So let me, let me just say uh, a couple of words about me as well. I'm, my name's Richard Lapper. I'm currently involved in a research uh, publication at the Financial Times called Brazil Confidential. I was Latin American editor of the newspaper for 10 years, and during that period I was a, a regular visitor to Venezuela. In fact, rather bizarrely, my fir the first person I met when I took that job in 1998 was Hugo Chavez, who then came to tea at the Financial Times in in May, six months before his presidential victory, and he said he would meet me on the uh, 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 in his victory celebration. Of course, he never did, but um, it was, uh, looking back on it, all seems a bit surreal now. Um, and now, 13 years on, um, Chavez on his sickbed, um, I think four cancer operations in Cuba. He's returned to Venezuela uh, in the last week or 10 days, I think, Communications that I've read over the last couple of days suggest that he's um, government saying he's still there. He's been sworn in, I think, on his on his hospital bed. Uh, but it uh, it looks pretty much uh, like it's the end, doesn't it, John? Mm. Yeah, it does. Um, <clears throat> that's what I understand. Uh, and uh, it was my sense that uh, I, for a few weeks before, of course, he 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 left for his operation in Cuba, the last one. I think it was the, took place the 10th or the 11th of December. And then there was this long period in which there was no sign of him. And it looked like things were bad. And uh, the, the sort of crisis of, of uh, the political crisis, uh, potential political crisis approached and then was averted because he needed to um, be sworn in, having been reelected early January, and it was finessed uh, by his circle of, um, <clears throat> of, uh, of aides, including his sort of, his, his, a, his named heir apparent, uh, Nicolas Maduro, who was the foreign minister before. Um, and, um, 
and, 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 and there's been this kind of penumbra in which he's been said to be struggling with breathing difficulties. Now, a few weeks before he was brought back, uh, which was last week, uh, I heard that the military hospital in Caracas was being prepared for him. And I mean, knowing Chavez, I think, you know, I'm sure that it was his wish to return to Caracas, whatever happened, uh, to die possibly there in his, in his homeland. Um, and my sense is that that's indeed what's kind of happening. We haven't seen him since he's gone back. The photograph was released showing him looking unusually robust with his two daughters uh, leaning in uh, towards him, uh, smiling uh, lovingly. And uh, his son-in-law, who is the communication minister, seems to have begun to prepare the, the ground for, for that eventuality by saying uh, just a couple of days ago that since he's returned, there hasn't been a positive, uh, uh, you know, there hasn't been a positive improvement in his health, and in fact, his breathing difficulty continues, uh, and, and it's serious. So, so I think, yeah, we're 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 in the final phase of of, of uh, Chavismo, led by Chavez, and whether whether his death occurs in this week or in the next six or eight or ten weeks, I think we're talking about that sort of. I could be wrong, you know. But I mean, people, I suppose, have rallied from serious cancer before. But all, all things look fairly serious for him. Do you both agree with that, Diego, Rory? Yes. Well, I, I think we're all often actually quite guessing, because it's quite hermetic in terms of the real information that, that's coming out is, 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 is very limited. But yes, I, I agree. I think it looks, I mean, it's either in his last weeks or, or last months. I think there's a lot of rumors, a lot of uncertainty. But among the, all the uncertainties, the only thing that remains certain is that President Chavez has not overcome the cancer and that he continues having a respiratory deficiency. And that's all official information. Well, look, maybe we can go on to talk <coughs> a little bit more about the, you know, the, the, the imminent post-Chavez era, the transition that Venezuela faces um, in a little while. What I want to do now is, is look at Chavez's record over the past 13 years. Um, Rory, in your, your book, um, you, in the first, in the introduction, you quote Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who interviewed Chavez in, similarly, it was a bizarre circumstances, really, on a flight coming back from Havana to Caracas at 2 a.m. in the morning. And at the end of his article, on the basis of that interview, he says that he's overwhelmed by the feeling that he had been traveling and chatting pleasantly with two opposing men, one to whom the caprices of fate had given an opportunity to save his country, the other an illusionist who could pass into the history books as just another despot. That's a judgment that Gabriel Garcia Marquez couldn't quite make his mind up in 1998, at the end of 1998, how do you think Gabor would, would see that? Well, now, I think that, he, that. He, he, he got it right 50%. Um, <laughs> and that I think the Chavez was never, never became uh, a full despot. I mean, there were despotic flashes, if you like, in terms of um, political opponents being jailed and kind of the bullying and occasional kind of thuggery. But he never became, you know, um, there were never death squads. There was never the kind of classic uh, kind of dictator behavior, despite the fact that people kept predicting this and saying that it was actually real. They never quite, the repression was always kind of quite light and selective. So I think as a, as a classic despot, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez was wrong. But the other side of his prediction was, was pure clairvoyance. Uh, Chavez was an illusionist. And, um, and, and Garcia Marquez is a very shrewd guy. He, he sensed it because uh, Chavez was such a, uh, a showman, such a, an enigmatic, charismatic, magnetic figure, and he could you know, bring, uh, talk so well um, that he, he really, he, he did, in a sense, cast an illusion. And I think that what makes his rule so fascinating, that we had 14 years of, the, of a gulf between his rhetoric um, and what he said was happening, and in a way, the reality. Now, there's always a gulf in, in, in politicians' rhetoric and reality. But in the case of, of Chavez, over time, it just became so a chasm, really. Um, 
and I think the apogee of, of this uh, 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 of, of this kind of dissonance was really was the election last year when he had to cast illusions on, on two things. One was the basic ruin of the country, uh, a country that's mired in, in dysfunction and decay and dilapidation, um, that's economic and social dysfunction. Um, and the other side of, of, his, of the necessary illusion was over his own physical decay. He had to conceal the fact that, that he was dying. Um, and so he, in effect, he lied to his, his own people saying, I'm cured, there's been a miracle, there's no cancer left in my body, I'm fine. Um, and as is increasingly clear, that we, you know, it was more or less clear at the time that this, this was implausible. But we now know now that it definitely was, was not, not true. Um, and yet he won. He won the election. Um, okay, it wasn't exactly a, uh, a totally uh, fair election, but it was a free election. He didn't stuff the ballot boxes. You know, there was no kind of. Um, and yet, yet he won. Um, and so, uh, and again, to go back to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, I think this guy was just an extraordinary. Uh, illusionist. I mean, a ravaged body, a decaying country, and he wins the election. Maybe it'd be good to explore that idea about the contrast between Chavez's rather personalist style and the condition, the the the, the fact really that Chavez, I think, we all, is a, I think you point out in the book, a tremendously charismatic figure, very very involved uh, in day to day decisions. Um, tremendously appealing man to me, but someone who began to dominate the political stage to such an extent that he institutions withered around him. Um, you know, so there's. I think. I think it's it's, it's jail. J J John, John, you note in your in your piece that Chavez makes things happen when he's present, but without him, the administration was chaotic and haphazard. It's almost as if you know, institutions were always weak in Venezuela, and it's one of the reasons, of course, why Chavez actually arrived there in the first place. You know, mm. there'd always been this myth that Venezuela was a perfectly functioning Latin American democracy, when in fact it was a extremely corrupt duopoly, uh, uh, and, and of two rather kind of uh, sclerotic parties. Um, but but the institutions, undeniably, over the last thirteen years, have become much weaker. Um, and, and there seems to be, you know, this, 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 this seems to be a, a characteristic of this, of this of Venezuela. Of ours. He's rarely seen this level of degeneration of institutions. And your piece, I guess, you know, the piece where, in, in, in Slumlord, where you describe the occupations that took place in Caracas since 2007 and the way that the, the, the city has become the fa a failed city, not so yeah. much a failed state, but a failed city, speaks to that, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I mean, uh, Laurie will have seen the same sort of deterioration in the span of time we were there. I mean, it wasn't like Venezuela was a Switzerland in in uh, '99 when when Chavez took office. I I came for the first time in 2001. I had briefly been there in the '80s, but I don't count it. What I remember, though, of that period. Venezuela was pr it was early 80s. Venezuela was probably at its kind of petrol fueled apogee. It was an odd city in that it's in this mountain valley where you see the hills everywhere. They're green, and there were slums on them. It wasn't different than any other Latin American city of the time in that sense, except that you looked up to the. I mean, Rio, I guess, would have been uh, equivalent. Um, but there was definitely a, a kind of separation between the poverty on the hills. And the city. The city was this, as I recall it, this rather boring, pristine, very North American kind of fueled economy where everything was buzzing along in modernity. And then there were these shacks on the hills, but not too many at the time. Now it's as if it's all suffused and the, the slums are kind of everywhere. And the, there's been a kind of slumification of the city itself with what amounts to uh, the kind of <clears throat> oases, cloistered, o guarded oases of middle class or upper middle class uh, privilege in guarded enclaves in a few parts of the city. And the rest of it really pretty much uh, edge city. I mean, you see it when you come in from the airport. There are indigent men 
living in the sewer pipes of the Guaire River, which is a vast sewage trough running down the center of it. And, um, you know, I've been coming for the past 14 years or 12 years, I guess, to, to um, Chavez's Venezuela. And on this last trip, I decided that my focus would be very specific. It was the one time in which I didn't have Chavez, who is uh, amiable and, you know, our fun, quite fun interlocutor, if you have access to him. And on all my previous trips, he was there, and I had access to him. And this time, the things that had bothered me but remained sort of in the middle distance were in the forefront. Um, and, um, and it was this incredible deterioration of the city. And, and Caracas, perhaps more than any city I know, shows it. It's something that's across Latin America, of course. We see, we've seen the, you know, the implosion of, of the cities in a, in, a, in a functional way. And it's happened in the United States as well. You know? But it's never happened to the degree that it's happened in Latin America, where <clears throat> the essential inequalities of the country are, are lived to such uh, uh, a gothic degree on a daily level. And so I chose <coughs> to look at a, a building that had been built in the, in the 80s as uh, Caracas's answer to uh, kind of Latin American Wall Street, this vast tower built by a, by, a, by a financial entrepreneur in Caracas who died before it was finished and things started to happen to Venezuela's economy just as he died. It was never finished. And over time, and under Chavez's uh, rule, this building became a vertical slum, uh, an invasion, um, as they called them, but which was the most emblematic of many such invasions that took place in the middle part of this last decade, where uh, buildings that were not <coughs> occupied, vacant lots, but including a couple of hundred buildings right in the city center itself, were invaded, as they call it in Spanish, invasiones, and occupied by, by people who didn't have a place to live, or who were doing business with that, the low rungs of society, and buying, the buying and selling, the forcible acquisition of real estate, and then the renting out of the buying and selling to other people who were at the bottom rungs of society. And it, seems extra, it seemed, and it seems extraordinary to me, that La Revolución couldn't tackle this, that it couldn't uh, um, ever make, uh, make this right this issue of, of a lack of housing. The slums are still there 14 years later. It's possible that, you know, uh, that, some of, that some of Chavez's programs, whether it be the, the Cuban doctors who come into the barrios and who give first aid and, and medical attention to Venezuelans that never had it before, that their lives have been improved by that. And I don't necessarily doubt that. I think it was a well-intentioned program. But there's a kind of unevenness to all of the programs. There's also been an attempt to emulate Lula's example of the Bolsa Familiar in Brazil after previous attempts by Chavez's own bureaucrats weren't very successful. How to quantify the improvement in the standard of living in a city or in a place where people are still living in slums and the most insecure slums virtually in Latin America. It's the violence is off the charts. It's, it's, it, you know, and, and so I ended up writing an extremely critical piece in which I had to assess El Chavismo uh, for its results as seen through this, first of all, through this building and then through uh, visits I made to some of the barrios and people I'd met on previous visits in which um, I found a kind of, uh, you know, there was the palace, there was Chavez, this kind of the rhetoric emanated from it. There was finally a kind of hectic, haphazard building program taking place. They were actually finally building some, some apartment buildings for the poor on one of the main avenues of the, you know, but very neglected now marginal uh, avenues of the city. But they were buildings that looked like they would last four or five years. I mean, they were really be slapping them up. And meanwhile, people were living and organizing uh, themselves in these spaces that they'd taken over. And they included 
both people from the slums and then people who were previously slum dwellers but who were left homeless by floods uh, just two years ago, which is, uh, I think 100,000. And they, too, crowded into uh, hotels, country clubs, um, buildings. And I got to know the people involved. And you can't fault them for wanting to live better or even to make common cause with a government that claimed to have them in its utmost interests. But there was a, there's, a, there's a kind of haphazardness to it that was disturbing. And, and I guess my inquiry ultimately went into an aspect of Chavismo that I was aware that was always there, which was in that the Chavez, to make his revolution, to make it radical, um, as he always wanted it to be, was, was you know, arrived in power with a fait accompli, which was that a big part of his constituency lived in the slums. And he never had the efficient bureaucracy or middle management or administrators or perhaps focus to truly end that, uh, that miserable existence for all of those people. But he made political common cause with it. And so, you know, if you have a situation where the barrios are already criminalized, where you have armed gangs in control of a lot of them, where you have automatic weapons circulating freely, and where some of them have militias that espouse uh, fealty to your revolution, you effectively leave things as they are. And so that's the situation that we more or less have. And um, there's, a, there's a term in Spanish and in Venezuela that's used a lot called malandreria, you know, los malandros, the villains, the thugs. And the thugs effectively rule the street in a lot of Caracas and in other parts of Venezuela now. And to a large extent, what I came to terms with in this piece and through this Torre de David, as they call it, the Tower of David, was that effectively that's, that's what the, the, the base constituency is. That, that however it came about, the revolution made common cause with a kind of, was a, with a kind of a thug culture that I don't quite know how they're going to undo at this point. And la malandreria is, to a large extent, one of the base components of the revolution, and that's a problem. Can I, let's just pick up a, um, I'm sure people will, will ask the question, you know, Chavez's, one of Chavez's main achievements, certainly when I was last in Venezuela, which was 2008, so it was before this, some of this deterioration has taken place, but clearly you could make the case then, and I still think, you probably suspect you could still make it now, that social provision by this government has been very strong, that there's been a, the, the, the effect of the various misiones, these Cuban doctors, you know, very <coughs> many thousands of Cuban doctors working in the barrios of Caracas, and in some of the smaller cities where I you know, conditions are certainly better. Uh, Caracas's problems, the informality of Caracas is a particular issue in a sense, which you, you, know, you, you address graphically in this piece. But social conditions in Venezuela, from a pro, you know, making the argument, social conditions have definitely um, improved in some ways. Uh, you know, the, the, the medical provision, and maybe it's, you know, is it sustainable? That's the big question, yeah, is it sustainable? But how much money is PDVSA? I think you were saying $23 billion that PDVSA has spent on social programs. This has got to have improved the social conditions of the poor. Um, do, do you think, I mean, do you think now, after 13 years, the poor are obviously better off? And also, let's face it, you know, Chavez won an election three or four months ago pretty solidly, yeah? There was no... There's no, you know, the, the, the right have often argued, the opposition have often argued that there's corruption, that there's fraud in the elections, and that's a case mm. they've never been able to prove. Chavez is the arch uh, tactician politically. You know, he's won elections. He's won them handsomely. And he's won them handsomely largely because he retains popularity. So despite this kind of incredible institutional deterioration that we see, the malandrage that you see in, 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 the, in the barrios, this is still a government that commands popular support. How do we explain that contradiction? Is, 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 um, first, is, let's have a look at social reform and the poor. You know, are the poor, the poor, is it simply a question of the poor are maybe better off in terms of you know, having enough to eat, but not very well off in terms of security and the broader aspects of well-being? Do you, do you want to take a go at that, Diego? Yeah, I think <clears throat> clearly, I mean, one of the key elements of 
chavismo, con los President Chávez uh, legacy, has been transforming the Venezuelan political culture. I mean, he clearly managed to put the issue of poverty alleviation and tackling social inequalities, inequalities at the top of the political agenda. Now, there's a big difference between formulating those policies at the top of the pyramid of norms in the Constitution, developing legislation towards that, and certainly uh, enacting policies towards that, and implementation. There's a clear case in Venezuela of policy implementation failure. One thing is the rhetoric, and one other thing absolutely different is what really happens out there. I think Rory does a great job in his book in portraying how this man uh, who came to power with a dream of really changing things got lost in a political process where he became obsessed by perpetuating himself in power, uh, where he uh, amended the constitution, which he himself sponsored in order to eliminate uh, term limits, to finally end up becoming the man who failed to tackle the main things that he came to uh, deal upon. Um, certainly, uh, the Misiones are a key component of President Chavez's uh, social programs. But the social the Misiones have come at a very big price to the Venezuelans. Uh, between 90,000 and 120,000 barrels a day are sent to Cuba in exchange of medical doctors, uh, school teachers, sports instructors, and even uh, intelligence uh, operatives in Venezuela. So clearly, uh, there's a, a big difference between what is there uh, of having clearly changed the political culture in Venezuela, of having put the issue of poverty alleviation and tackling social inequalities at the top of the political agenda, but that something absolutely different uh, is happening uh, in the ground. And it just takes us. Uh, I remember John's article, fantastic article, uh, article about uh, David and the Tower, I think it was called. Uh, it just takes you to go to the Venezuelan airport and go from the airport towards Caracas to see all the shanty towns around. So I think that's a key distinction we need to make. What do you think, Rory, in terms of the social <coughs> progress that's been made in the six years you were there? Yeah, well, I mean, th there certainly was. Um, some social progress, and the government had, in some ways, Chavez and the government did have its, its heart in the right place, and had some innovative ideas. For example, the um, Barrio Adentro, which is to bring these Cuban doctors into the barrios, right into the you know to the heart of of, of the slums, and um, that's uh, that was a great idea. Um, the problem uh, was uh, twofold. One was that that uh, Mission, that program itself, was became very neglected to the point that uh, Fidel Castro himself um, said there's a crisis here, you know, because so many of them were shutting down. A lot of the Cuban doctors uh, and nurses fled. Um, others were, um, were intimidated in their area. So there was a problem of, of maintenance and sustaining that system. And the, other, the second part of the problem was that the traditional health structure, like the, the hospitals, the public hospitals, um, were totally neglected um, because they were not flagships of the revolution. Chavez had inherited them. So he had no political interest in actually uh, sustaining them or investing in them. So they be just became horrible. I mean, you, and I've been in public hospitals across Latin America, and some of the worst I've seen are in Venezuela, which is actually is a much richer country than many other of, of, of its neighbors. And when I say, I mean, horrible, I mean, you go outside and it's like a bazaar. People are selling bandages, sheets, um, and then if you go inside the hospitals, there's no bulbs. Uh, it's kind of a Dickensian. Uh, yeah, you're, you're crunching over broken glass. Uh, there's malandros in, in, the, in, the, in the corridors, maybe with guns. Sometimes there are shootings in hospitals. The doctors, which is why most, a lot of Venezuelan doctors and nurses have emigrated. Um, and so when you talk about public health system, and it was like, in theory, it was, should have been the big success story of the revolution. In fact, in the end, really, it became very problematic. And I think this was symptomatic of often Chavez would just would not follow through on ideas. And over time, he became more and more obsessed about uh, his image um, at the expense of governance. Um, and I'll just give you one example. Um, he would speak about jails, because he had served time in jail after his coup attempt in 1992. 
and he felt very passionate about it, about improving the jails, because he inherited a pretty horrible jail system uh, when he came to power. And he said, we're going to fix this. And in fact, he sounded like, you know, it's like a Guardian editorial, and it's very progressive and enlightened, and it sounded great. Um, and yet, yeah, what happened over the 14 years was the jail system got worse and worse, went from horrible to barbaric and shocking, to the point that the, the, the bloodbaths that happen in Venezuelan jails is on a per capita scale that is far beyond anything that happens in Brazil or Mexico. And um, I remember I was quite struck when I interviewed a, a mid-ranking member of the, um, the, the penal service, a civil servant, and she uh, was saying, well, she made two points. One was that now the, the prisoners were had taken to strangling. Uh, the gangs would strangle prisoners inside the prison because this way the, the deaths could be classified as, uh, as uh, suicide even though the guards would know, everybody would know it was obviously a murder, but it suited everybody because then it keeps the numbers down. So the, the governor would leave the guards, in, uh, the, the, the gangs in peace, and everybody, they can continue strangling people as much as they wanted. So even the, the official murder rate of 500 people in prisons per year was, was, was being massaged. And secondly, she said that, um, and this gets to the, the governance issue, that um, he, Hugo Chavez was so obsessed about, you know, it's always like this kind of manic uh, governance, you know, it's full of ideas and uh, having to change gears and, you know, lots of motion. He's always moving in a blur of activity, and which has made him a brilliant campaigner uh, mm -hmm. for elections um, and for a particular issue he could really focus on it. And as a military guy, he was good at that, at, at campaigns. But then in terms of governance, um, he was dreadful. It just it was just the, the the incompetence. And so, for, for example, to go back to the prisons, uh, this this administrator told me that they had gone through basically a, a, a penal director one uh, one every year, a continuous rotation. And um, she said, finally, we had one guy who was competent. Oh my God, he was brilliant. He was such a great guy. You know, he, he's the first competent guy we'd had in ages, and he's beginning to get to grips with it. And you know, in the department, we felt maybe now we can do something. But then she said, Chavez recognized this guy. Oh, this guy's good. He's competent. So he plucks him, and he appoints him to the head of his Twitter account. <laughs> and, then they, and then they put in a new incompetent to run the prison service. And we saw just, and it is kind of a kind of black comedy aspect to it, but we just saw another you know, really <coughs> grisly massacre in the prisons just a few weeks ago. I think it was about 64 people killed. Uh, you know, and that's not funny. Um, and you apply that sort of anecdote about the Twitter and, uh, and the issue of, you know, uh, of governance versus, you know, basic competence. And the result is the deterioration and degradation that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about Barrio Adentro. Um, I think, you know, one of the problems that the Cubans found, I mean, I remember going around with the Cuban doctors um, around the Barrio in Eastern Caracas, and they, because these Cuban doctors are, are like missionaries. I mean, they are extraordinarily committed people. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they're away from their families for two years. The sort of people who've, you know, sort of spent two years at the, the Moscow Institute of Marxism, Leninism in the 1980s. And they, they, go, they go on missions to Angola and Haiti and so on. And they do, you know, they've got two kids at home, 12 and 10 or whatever. And they come to Caracas for another two years. And, you know, they stay in these terrible places where they're shooting every night. And, and they, they're great. You know, they do great work. They tell people how to, you know, what to eat and how to boil their water if they've got diarrhea and so on and so forth. Basic health care, right? And the Venezuelan government has a program to train its own doctors to do, the, to, 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 to do these jobs, to do basic health care. The problem is that the Venezuelan doctors don't know, don't, aren't prepared to live in barriers, right? So you've got this problem of sustainability because the Cubans can't be there forever. They can't always be there, right? And this is a real difficulty, I think, for Venezuela that the, the, the quality of the, the, you know, Venezuelan doctors do not live in, in, in the rancheros. They just don't do it. And that is, you know, now whatever Chavez does or wants or, or, or doesn't want, you know, there's a fundamental problem there about the way the, you know, the sort of grain of Venezuelan society is set. And I just wondered in that context, you know, whether you think, you know, obviously Chavez's voluntarism and utopianism has made that problem worse to some extent. Because, you know, if you've got to build institutions, it's a slow process. I would strongly disagree with that. Uh, I think Venezuelan doctors are fantastic. And I think uh, if they had been given the chance to go inside the barrio and provide it with security as well, to, you know, 
uh, with the proper infrastructure, shall I say, to really deliver those health services within, I'm absolutely sure uh, that through the health ministry, that uh, project uh, will have uh, rendered different uh, results. I think this is one of the key things which uh, we need to analyze from, from the, the whole concept of the missions. Because what are the missions? The missions basically are projects, social programs, which are aimed at filling gaps over policies, such as the healthcare policy of the government, which the government is not providing efficiently. I mean, you have fantastic hospitals in Venezuela. And uh, clearly, there is a need to create and introduce uh, a modulo, uh, a medical unit within the barrio. But one of the key things why Venezuelan doctors, which are fantastic and very well trained, which were not introduced there, was clearly to have a political component, a component to bring the Cubans within there to sort of portray the similarities, the parallels between what the government was trying to do through you know, the political project process in Venezuela and how this uh, allocation of doctors within the barrio could uh, render positive results to solving uh, a need there. I think, you know, I think, I don't know that we're in, really mm -hmm. in, in fundamental disagreement. I mean, I think that, that but, but there's, a, you know, what we are probably, we've all seen, is a, is a lack of follow-through or implementation, whether or not it had a political component or not. I remember at a certain point, you know, making visits to the Misiones and having to deal with very militant, you know, ultra-left-wing um, barrio sort of vigilantes who were my interlocutors and having to put up with a kind of, this kind of, you know, skin deep radicalism that was as sectarian and pamphletary as it was anything else. It was, the problem was that, you know, if you're gonna do a Marxist revolution, do it right, you know? I mean, there was never, it was never absorbed beyond the, the pores um, and, um, but nonetheless, I met a lot of, you know, and I, even on this trip, I've met, I met, you know, organizadores de barrio who are, who are idealistic <coughs> and they're spending their lives on behalf of other people and they're living their ideals to the left of Chavismo, you know. They're armed in the barrios because they think that what's going to come will sell out what's, what little progress has been made. Um, they see, they see mainstream Chavismo as incredibly corrupt and having empowered the Guardia Nacional, the National Guard, which has had no, uh, no uh, supervigilancia, no, um, what do you call it, surveillance, no, no, no independent body to surveil it or its activities for years now. And a kind of, a kind of, a kind of, you know, a gangster state emerging from underneath the rhetoric of, and perhaps fair-minded Chavistas a proliferation of ministries to, to, you know, there's now a prison minister that he created since mm -hmm. you, you know, just in the last few weeks or last few months, there was a young woman named it, it, prison it minister. Yeah. And while I was there, she was shot at visiting a prison by the prisoners, of course, who were armed, um, you know, uh, and was negotiating with the Pranes, who are the gangsters who control the prisons, not the prison wardens. But that was the case 12 years ago. I visited the prison where Chavez was held, and I went with the former warden. We drove, I said, I'd like to see it. He said, well, I'll take you on a tour of the exterior. He, we drove to an open cell blocks, so that, and he said, look quickly, because we can't stay here long. They'll begin shooting at us. And, and we stayed, I think, about 10 seconds, time enough for me to see at like an open book to what, maybe eight-story cell blocks with all of the railing, all of the, what do you call them, the um, grill work, the, uh, you know, pulled out. And in one case, it looked like a mortar shell had hit. It was huge. And there was a lot of men without shirts on hanging out, looking pretty fierce uh, there. And a wall of, and excuse the French, a wall of black shit, literally going down six or seven stories of the entire building to a, a, an oleaginous, pestilence mass that had filled the grounds outside the prison. I don't know what it was anymore, but it was still liquid. And it had been there for years. And there, were, there was bullet holes in the walls of the prison. And as he pointed out, because we began speeding towards the control towers, they were also pocked with bullets. Because of course they had, 
running battles back and forth, shooting from the towers to the prison and back and forth. And he told me that when he was a warden, it had been three or four, maybe six years since anyone had gone into the inner sanctum of the prisoners. They only allowed one of his guards, one particular hand-picked guard, to go in to collect bodies, and that was it. Um, and so that's the situation of the prison system. But that's also the situation of the barrios. These same characters are the ones who run the black economy in the country. And they do it from the sanctuary of the prisons. It's not exclusive to Venezuela. But, ojo, you know, it's happening under the watch of the Bolivarian Revolution. What's going on? That's my point, really. And that was my point with this piece. It was like, how, why aren't you controlling this? Why is it out of control? What's gone wrong here? Why haven't you, you know, why haven't you done what the Cubans did if you were going to do a revolution? What, what's going on here? Um, and, and so, uh, you know, one other anecdote, just two actually, very briefly, this, this thing of implementation, it's been a problem from the beginning. Um, I went with Chavez on a flying trip around the country once, early on, and um, we went to the Amazon, to a little outpost in the Amazon called Esmeralda. It was a beautiful place, but just literally a runway in the middle of the jungle. I don't know if you ever made it there. But he was there to give a speech to the awaiting dignitaries and indigenous groups, and leader, elders who had come, because um, he had, they, were, they were giving them a, a, a lot of sort of fiberglass canoes for a kind of riverine ambulance service that had never been there before, which was a good thing. And, um, you know, and Chavez, so Chavez, there was a part of the airstrip where he began to give a speech. And at a certain point, I was wandering around because he gives long speeches. And, <laughs> and I saw this blur in the distance and, and then finally a noise. And bef lo and behold, a group of 30 armed, fully painted, drugged to the gills, Yanomami Indians with spears, yipping and baying emerged from the jungle and came tearing <laughs> full on down the runway towards <coughs> where Chavez was. And as I watched a group of National Guardsmen, and I guess his Secret Service, uh, peeled away to head them off. And I went running to, to see what was going on. And they, they stopped them three or 400 feet away from Chavez. And they were, they'd been running for days, as they do when they go on the warpath. And they were so hysterical that I only found one who could actually speak Spanish and, sp and, and spit out what they were angry about. And it was, you know, it was local politics. Their communities hadn't been given the river ambulances. They were angry and wanted to come and tell Chavez. Well, they never got to because they were kept away three or 400 feet away, as I say, on the airstrip. Chavez continued to give his speech. I, s I took pictures. I talked with them. I was fascinated to see them. And eventually, I wandered back to where Chavez was winding up. And the minute he did, the jet was ready to go. And we went into the jet and flew back to Caracas. And I remember sitting down with him on that flight. And I had witnessed that and a number of other things in recent days, which was that at every stop, you might remember, the people would hand little papelitos, their wishes and desires or, or you know, what they needed in little pieces of paper. And they, were, they became hysterical if they couldn't hand it to Chavez directly. And at a certain point, it got you know, out of control. And he had, he had aides whose specific function was to collect the papers. And I had seen this for several days, plus the Yanomami incident. And I, I, I asked him, I said, now, what's the deal with the papelitos? And he says, every day, my staff puts them all together. And I'm, I see every single one. I said, every single one? He says, all of the ones that are really relevant. And he says, and we deal with each one. We deal with each one. Each, you know, I have a good team, and they, you know, they vet them. And he swore to me, and he clearly believed, I didn't, had no reason to believe he was being disingenuous, that he actually fulfilled the demands of all of those people. And of course, you know, he hadn't even seen the Yanomamis, and never would, and would never even know about them. Um, I mentioned it. It kind of went in one ear, out the other because there was some other affair of state to take care of at the time. But that was quite typical, quite typical of, 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 of implementation early on. And then over the years, he's, you know, as he's perceived the need, he's invented a new ministry. Um, I think 47 or 54, I don't know how many. And there were 14 at the beginning. It's like tripled or quadrupled. 
in terms of ministry. Yeah. Rory, I mean, you, you write very interestingly about Allo Presidente, which is the theatre, the Sunday theatre of Chavez that, you know, in a sense, typifies what, what, what John's, John's talking about. You write about the Ministry of Information that offers no information. Um, mm -hmm. It's a hive of activity where you can't get any basic information from it. Yeah. Yes, I mean, well, at its at its best, it's 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 a wonderfully transparent form of government, Al Presidente, because he's he's on TV. You can see often his decision making, because you can see him actually thinking and making decisions while he's sitting at his desk, and it's a it's a roving show. I mean, every week there'll be at a, often a different location, and a very freewheeling affair, and there'll be guests on it, and um, and sometimes it could be great because you you would see. Um, he'd have ministers there, and you know he'd be engaging with with people, and so in, there would be this wonderful transparency, and and he's this wonderful presence, and so people would tune in because it's it's interesting. But I think over time um, it became something else as well. It became an intentional circus to to distract people from things because as I think disappointments were were mounting, and as you began to see things, this, this sort of graffiti like um, uh, "Bajo el gobierno viva Chavez," "Down with the government, long live Chavez." Meaning that people, ordinary Venezuelans, were 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 getting frustrated with with problems of insecurity or inflation and so forth, but they, they retained a certain you know an affinity uh, uh, with Chavez. So, but his show increasingly had to um, create a circus, really, to create distractions and and so on. And I myself was uh, ended up being part of the circus or like a, a an animal in the circus one time when I was on the show, and um, I he invited me to ask a question, and uh, I uh, he said um. So I asked him about term limits. It was he was preparing to uh, fight a, a referendum to abolish term limits, and I asked him, basically, you know, was it not a risk of authoritarianism creeping in if term limits were abolished? Um, and he, uh, I took major umbrage at this, or at least affected to, and he um, basically spent 30 minutes uh, denouncing me as an agent of, of British imperialism, um, and that this was a terrible example of European cynicism, and what about genocide in Africa? What about you know the wars of conquest against indigenous people? And what about the Royal Navy? Who elected the British <laughs> Queen? And meantime, the AIDS, and we're passing him lists of, of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, of countries in Europe that Malta doesn't have uh, term limits, and you know, and you know, he would fire each of these names as, as a, you know, as a firing a gun at me, and I, you know, and the camera zeroing in on my face. So I'm, you know, trying to like, well, I keep a straight face and stop sweating because we're on the beach. It was roasting, and um, <laughs> and this went on, and it's funny because then at the end he said, "So what do you think of that?" Uh, which is unusual. It's often he doesn't give people that chance to answer back, but the microphone is handed back, and I said, "Well." You know, firstly, um, I'm not English, I'm Irish. <laughs> uh, and secondly, I'm a Republican. Y you know, so really what I think about the British Queen or what I think about the monarchy really is not relevant. No importa, you know, it doesn't matter what I think. And I must say, Mr. President, I noticed you didn't actually answer the question, so let me, you know, repeat it. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, then the whole thing starts all over again. And, you know, I, 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 and, and he, he turns my, my words against me. and. Um, and this went on, and the people, the, the, the Chavistas around me, like were kind of edging away, you know, leaving me in this kind of puddle of sweat, you know. Um, and eventually it ended, and he moved on, and you know, the, um, and well, just two final points on that. Then he actually, oddly enough, about three or four hours later, he came back to my question and he answered it, and he said, "Look, the reason I need to abolish term limits is because the, the revolution is like a painting, and I'm the artist." And you cannot, halfway through the painting, hand the brush to another artist. You know, the same artist has to finish the painting. And, and that was his answer. And it was, I think it was a sincere answer, you know, and that was his, his chosen metaphor. And that was interesting. And, and secondly, when the show ended, um, you know, the, the, the ministers and the mayors who'd been you know, around me, they were like, I was kind of toxic and they're afraid of approaching me. Um, except that until Chavez himself, at this point, the cameras are being packed away, and he came up and, and he shook my hand. He's very warm and, and, and amiable as, as he is. Um, and he wished me well, and you know, how's it going? And, and the gist was, hey, you know, no hard feelings, you know, <laughs> you're a useful punch bag, but <laughs> it's just a show, you know, I don't, don't, don't worry about it. You know, and then he was appeared into his trailer, and then all the other ministers were shaking my hand, oh, yeah, whatever. And, <laughs> And so the, the point is then he, he's great at, at a circus. In that case, I was the, I was, you know, the, the prop, you know? I mean, he, I kind of live a bit of spice in an otherwise, you know, six hours of discussing agricultural policy or whatnot. You know, he had, and then, oh yeah, here's a British imperialist punch bag, you know, and that was a bit of fun for, for the TV viewers. And, you know, fair enough, I mean, it's politics. But, you know, you, again, you extrapolate that, um, and it, that as a form of government, 
Um, and the result, again, is just, you know, the governance uh, and competence is sacrificed for, for, for the show. Mm. You also say how difficult it is as a journalist to be covering uh, Allo Presidente, you, you're having to sort of listen for six, seven hours, and it goes on interminably, and having to be aware for those subtle changes in tone when something important is announced, because important <laughs> things can be announced in Allo Presidente. Yes, and you, a lot of, well, especially the agency journalists really got it worse because they would have to watch it, you know, a lot. And they could basically never leave the office because so much of Venezuela is just watching television because the, the president is there and he, anything can happen. He'll mobilize troops at the border. He'll hire ministers, fire ministers. You, you never know. Um, so these guys would go nuts. And was, I remember there was one, one Reuters journalist, very nice chap. And he, after two years, he, I remember he, he said, well, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm, I'm going to go to the Zargos Mountains of Iran and write poetry. <laughs> and he, he spoke Farsi as it happened. So, I mean, it was a plausible thing to do. And he did. He resigned and he quit. Um, whereas others, those who survived, the journalists, uh, could do this long term. It was, um, you know, you could learn to like, you'd be kind of on duty to watch El Presidente and, um, and you could kind of multitask, you'd either do the ironing or you're writing up a separate story or, you know, you're washing up and, and you know, and a lot of it you could kind of zone out because it's whatever's going on. But I mean, he, at least those, the connoisseurs or gourmets of the show uh, said that you could often, there's kind of like a switch in his voice, like a t some tonal thing and that you just knew that's, okay, now it's coming, now the, the, the news <laughs> the newsworthy bit, whatever it is, 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 is coming. And then that's when you stop doing the ironing and you listen. Um, and sure enough, he would say something. And then that's your story for the day. And, and he knew that. I mean, because he knew that journalists are not going to spend eight hours you know, following every single word. Um, and so it was a very kind of surreal place. You know? And it's always, when I was living there for six years, to kind of capture that and explain that to people overseas especially, it was so difficult because, you know, you know, you get this kind of polarized, simplistic version, like Chavez is the demon, um, you know, he's kind of bloodthirsty, some sort of semi-Stalinist character, which was ridiculous, or he's this messianic character who's delivering the poor from, from hell and he's making, building a shining city on a hill, which was equally ridiculous. And to capture the realities and the nuances of it was actually really, really difficult. And that's frankly why I wrote the book, because he just he couldn't capture those nuances in a 600-word article. We should probably move on to discuss a little bit, you know, what, what, what's in, in prospect now uh, for Venezuela. Um, because I, I want to give, I mean, we were supposed to end in, I want to give a chance for people to ask questions and so on. But before we do that, I mean, what, what, what is going to happen now? Um, you know, there, there's a, I think there were two, I mean, Maduro is obviously the you know the president designate uh, designated by Chavez. There's a, as I understand it, a powerful, more radical faction within the you know the Chavista party, um, led by Diaz Dado, the president of the assembly that has also got aspirations for power. I mean, the opposition, you know, is probably stronger than it's been for some time. Um, there probably will be an election at some point in the next uh, six to twelve months. Um, I mean, how do you see it panning out, uh, Diego? Yeah, certainly in the next days, what we're going to see is the swearing ceremony first. Uh, we have a president which has started the constitutional term 2003, uh, 2009, but which has not yet swear in because the uh, Supreme Court of Justice postponed indefinitely uh, the ceremony until President Chavez was fit to come back. That's the first thing we're going to see. Then, uh, if the, the, the issue of President Chavez's incapacitation is indeed confirmed, then we're going to see most likely elections taking place this year. Now, the interesting thing is what is going on in Venezuela. And as you were saying, uh, what makes this whole situation awkward is the fact that Venezuela is used to have uh, President Chavez at the center of the political dynamics, having this strong man which you know, runs the show. Now, what we're seeing in Venezuela now is the Chavismo without Chavez. And uh, it's very scary from a democratic point of view because basically what we're seeing is a de facto administration in which President Chavez nominally appears at the top, heading a government, but real power is being exercised and the decisions are being taken by Nicolás Maduro, the vice president, and indeed by Diosdado Cabello, the head of the National Assembly, ruling the United Socialist Party of Venezuela. 
Now, the interesting thing about Cabello and, and Maduro, uh, there has long been uh, rumors about you know, tensions between the two, which has been pointed as a possible successor of Chavez. Now, the interesting thing about these two characters is that uh, they seem to be having a, a sort of marriage of convenience, where both are, you know, have the incentive to cooperate, to give continuity to the Chavismo, because they know that if they don't, do not cooperate, then the, the, the opposition is going to increase their prospects, especially ahead of the troubled economic and social times in Venezuela. Now, Diosdado Cabello is a really, really interesting character because he participated with President Chavez in the 1992 military coup in 4 February, and he operates as a sort of union representative of the different military factions, and uh, taking into account that this is a government which has not only politicized the armed forces, but also militarized civil society, uh, the armed forces are going to play a key role, are going to be the key arbiter in the days to come, in whatever is going to happen in Venezuela. So if Maduro is certainly going to be Chavez's successor, he's going to need more than President Chavez's blessing. And you know, uh, whether uh, the armed forces are willing to certainly accept that you know, the different Chavista factions are going to gather under his leadership is something that remains to be seen. Yeah, just to add, I mean, I, I agree. The, the one thing that may also become more um, more apparent to all of us is the is the kind of uh, is the is the quite um, quite combustive presence of the military. I mean, again, with Chavez sort of on center stage all this time, you know, even he described his his revolution as a kind of civic military alliance in which. You know, of course, he came out of the military, uh, but had donned uh, a suit and yet used quite military language and, and, and a style in in his uh, leadership. Uh, but there's a, there's a, the prevalence of the military, and the, their their involvement in many aspects of of the governance of the country will become much more apparent without him on the scene. I think, and it will be. More, more so with Maduro uh, on stage, a younger man, uh, not that much younger, but younger, and a civilian, not an insider necessarily, although ideologically sound in the sense that he's a true believer and comes out of you know comes out of, comes off the street, out of the unions, um, but no doubt the the you know the push and pull between him and Diosdado Cabello, who after all will be the the strong man coming from the military, sort of rump state, will probably become more apparent. And we could, we could begin to see tensions there, depending on, on how things work economically. If everything begins to go pear-shaped and what, you know, you know, despite all the dysfunction, a lot of money has been flowing through the Venezuelan economy and, you know, to an extraordinary degree because of the petrol uh, uh, surge. Um, but if, if that if there begins to be shortfalls in any in any particular sector, you could see you could see serious tension. Um, when I was there, uh, the uh, mayor of the main part of uh, of, uh, of Caracas, Libertador, and the former vice president himself, Jorge Rodriguez, yeah, Rodriguez, told me that the President Chavez, the, the the social debt that they had they had they had expended already five hundred billion dollars on what they call the social debt programs of social implementation or whatever. And again, I remember being stunned at that figure um, because, you know, you, you look around Caracas and you sure can't see it. Now, um, again, uh, you know, ineptitude, maybe, maybe part and parcel of, of, of so many, of so many pet oil states, you know, maybe, maybe Venezuela is doomed to be sort of Latin America's Nigeria or something. So this kind of dysfunction that seems to be part and parcel essence it's also a democratic state with a dictatorial past. Nigeria. I don't know. Is it possible, though, to see a stable outcome? I mean, you know, it's very interesting that you know one of the reasons that uh, one of the things that's happened over the past five or six years is that the relationship, the economic relationship with China, has become you know deepened. Uh, yeah. China's invested, I think, something like thirty-five billion dollars in in Venezuela. You know, Cuba plays an important role, as we've seen, in terms of you know social service provision, institutional substitution of its own institutions, in a way. 
Um, you know, Chavez, it's true, it's the military were, you know, were, were an important factor, but they've been, Chavez has you know, divided the military, he's played with the military. I mean, Rory writes in his book, you know, the way that he plays around with the promotions, buys up one faction against another, you know. But the military, despite all that, you know, retain some institutional integrity. Um, there might be a force for stability. Is it, is it possible that we might see, with all that we you know, there's Cuba, China, the military might see a stable transition when, with Chavez not I think anything, the center? anything is possible. One plausible scenario is that um, after Chavez dies, that Maduro wins uh, the election, and that as long as oil prices stay quite high, they can always um, and they keep, well, continue to try to borrow more from China and use the oil money to kind of keep filling the cracks um, with this glue of oil, um, and so we, then of which, in that case, we would continue to see continued degradation, but never full collapse. And because unlike, say, Nigeria, there are no kind of ethnic divisions in, or religious divisions in Venezuela. So it's quite a homogenous country in that sense. Um, and, you know, and it could kind of bumble on, you know, and Maduro could serve out, you know, could then serve six years, hypothetically, um, as, as that. So, I mean, it's, it's plausible. I, I, um, how likely it is, I, I, I don't know. One key issue in Venezuela is the fact that the armed forces exercise a sort of constitutional police where they safeguard and they are vigilant of the democratic process. Now, so far, all the change that have taken place in Venezuela has been, uh, in a way, been uh, conducted uh, in a dubious way from a uh, legal point of view. But the current situation in Venezuela now, in which clearly the Constitution foresees that in the case of President Chavez's incapacitation, an election needs to be called within 30 days. And uh, the fact that this de facto administration that is in place in Venezuela is not uh, sort of like following what the Constitution expressly demands could clearly change uh, uh, this internal dynamics within uh, the armed forces. Now, the other thing is that other top military commanders, uh, again, this is, a, this is we, we need to understand that this is a political process which has a very strong military component. And I think that's one of the contradictions uh, when uh, you know, uh, they try to frame this, this project, uh, this Bolivarian revolution under a sort of like Marxist or left-wing approach, it doesn't seem much, when you analyze it closely, it does seem like more of, as a nationalist thing, rather a proper left-wing socialist thing. And this is something which uh, I think uh, we have to be careful when we assess in the future, which is going to be President Chavez's legacy. Uh, now, one of the key things is that uh, top military commanders will not perhaps feel comfortable over, not only over, over uh, this de facto administration uh, being managed of Maduro, and Cabello, but would also not feel comfortable, perhaps, over how uh, being represented by uh, Cabello himself as, you know, sort of like the military component on this uh, sort of uh, matrimonio arreglado, you know, this uh, marriage of convenience in which uh, Maduro plays the political side, uh, Cabello plays the military side, and there are other components. Ramirez, for example, the Minister of Energy and Oil and the head of, of a state-owned oil company, Perez, a place, you know, sort of like the economic bit, uh, Hawa, which is, uh, you know, one of the key leaders of some of the most uh, uh, radical factions, uh, you know, is uh, in charge of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, yeah, I think uh, those are key things too. At this point, can I ask for questions? Because uh, I think we're, we've got a little while left, and there, I'm sure there's lots of questions to come. Hello. Um, before it was, people assumed that by Chavez dying, the opposition had a clear path to power. Now it doesn't seem that clear. What do you think the opposition has to do in order to make that happen and harness this opportunity? Should we take a couple of questions, given the time? Um. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask um, what's going to be the story? Uh, after Chavez dies, because it seems like with few exceptions, like in your case, most of the time the editors from abroad uh, demand either very Chavez-centric or very oil-centric stories. 
when they deal with Venezuela. So now what, what's going to be the story after Chavez dies? Is he still going to be remaining, you know, looming? Or, or are people just going to get bored of Venezuela? I, I wanted to, to ask the panel whether or not um, there we have been present at a revolution. Um, in the last 10 years, there have been aspirations raised in Venezuela in health, in education, in housing, and so on. Um, but there's also been a substantial international movement where other countries are following similar routes. And I just wondered... Uh, um, are you saying, because you seem to be saying, oh, well, that's a blip and we can return to the past, or are we saying um, that there are revolutionary forces at work in that region um, which we should take note of? Just stop it there. I mean, in, in start with that question about has there been a revolution? Now, I think, you know, the, the other two questions kind of logically follow on from that. I mean, has there been a revolution in, in Venezuela, John? I, I, I hesitate because I, I, I don't know that that the judgment can really be made yet. I, um, I, I, I lean towards saying not. I think it was the revolution that would, um, but wasn't. Um, it, it definitely created a, 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 a constituency for revolution in Venezuela where perhaps there wasn't one. I mean, Chavez's constituency, by and large, uh, people who were, by and large, people who were poor or previously poor, still poor, and living in in um, in precarious circumstances, now have a sense of uh, entitlement in an oil state, which was previously uh, entirely orchestrated or managed along. I suppose, uh, uh, you know, classically laissez-faire capitalist lines, with, however, a fairly strong state component under the under the previous two governments. Uh, it's always quite a strong state in the middle, but with a thrusting capitalist middle class. Um, there, there's now, in other words, a militant uh, core um, of people who feel who to a certain extent have been the beneficiaries of a patronage system, which came with a lot of revolutionary rhetoric. Again, as I said earlier in the talk, I'm not sure how deeply absorbed uh, the, that ideology, the revolutionary consciousness is. It's not my impression that it is very deep. Um, um, I think that um, by and large people, people People go with opportunity, and, and people were willing to go along with a system that seemed to look out for their interests for the first time, and thus the kind of almost febrile um, embrace of Chavez, who, who clearly was the personification of that, uh, you know, that intention. Um, the rest of it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a giant made of clay, I feel unfortunately, for those people who've invested so much time, sweat, effort, and faith in it. Um, is there and has there been, at the same time, a kind of revolutionary current that's taken root in the hemisphere? Yes, to a degree. Chavez, in a way, was a genius of opportunity, I think. he, Again, I think historically, he, you know, he's so often been written off as a buffoon, I think that's been a mistake. Um, he may, he's somehow a tragic figure in some ways. Um, I think as Rory, uh, pointed out. Um, I think um, that does not, that does not, um, uh, you know, that does not, um, as, as, as Fidel once said, that, that does not absolve him of his responsibilities for having created a, a kind of a, a nation of, of ex, of, full of millions of people of expectation and, and leaving them perhaps high and dry. I fear that that will be at least part of the story to come um, in this petro, you know, this kind of messy petrol fueled country where oil still is at the core of everything, and in which you have a military that's been, as I said earlier, and I, I say that with intention, beyond the can or the ability of anybody outside 
much less the state itself, to surveil the activities of. You know, the involvement by the Guardia Nacional apparently in drug trafficking on a massive scale, things like that. You know, again, unexplained and unreconciled and unresolved uh, problems that are inherent to the way the state's been run in recent years, I think, um, and perhaps the way it was run before. Perhaps that's part of the inheritance, you know. Um, but, but I feel that um, Chavez, as I, as I was saying, in, at least in some measure, can be seen as a genius of opportunity. You know, he found his radical uh, apogee at the very moment, speaking beyond, beyond Venezuela, on the international stage, um, against, you know, refracted against George W. Bush. You know, I mean, what, it was, it was almost like a chemical reaction, you know. The fact that George W. Bush, you know, such a fool, was on the world stage in the most powerful nation on earth for eight years and created two unpopular, unwinnable wars around the world and seemed to threaten more, gave Chavez. It's like one of those little origami fish that the Japanese sell. You put water in it and it grows big, isn't it? Or like a shrimp. You know, it just became huge. And in a sense, it's part of, I think, Venezuela and Chavez's tragedy because he became such a man of international um, ambition that he didn't look at the bottom line back at home. You know, the slums are still there, the insecurity's worse, et cetera. While he was jetting back and forth between every character who mouthed off at Bush like him, hoping to build this multipolar world, like Joseph with his multicolored robe, you know, Lukashenko, <laughs> Ahmadinejad, Saddam, Gaddafi, Fidel, you know, only to find, you know, only to come back to the same basic problem. But, but, you know, there was something there in the hemisphere. You know, Evo Morales and Correa, and I'm not going to include Daniel Ortega just because it's Daniel. You know, he's such a, a crass malandro himself. And, you know, but, but basically there, 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 there was a kind of a need for an, an alternative uh, uh, voice. You finally have an indigenous leader for the first time in the indigenous country par excellence in Latin America, Bolivia. You know, you have a, a Correa who isn't exactly a clone, even if he was helped and mentored heavily, as was Evo by Chavez at, at a certain moment. These are clearly people who have a different point of view, who, for better or worse, are, are, have adopted a kind of contestatory policy vis-a-vis -vis El Imperio, the empire, the United States, but are, are a little more pragmatic, it seems, following their own course. However, they end up, we don't know yet. And um, so, yes, I think he, he found a moment and, um, and, and perhaps, perhaps squandered it or perhaps helped galvanize something that will find a rootedness. Will, will institutions that he helped create like ALBA and these other sort of blocks, these economic blocks, finally, uh, will, will, they, will they outlast him? Uh, and will they outlast the Bolivarian Revolution? I, I, we don't know. Will 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 you know Maduro continue to fuel uh, Cuba to the extent that Chavez has? I suspect not. He won't be able to quite to the same degree um, because of economic uh, exigencies. But you know, there's no doubt that, that for whatever else you say, that Chavez has had an extraordinary uh, presence on the regional stage, and that he he will have meant something. He will have have represented something, you know. His, his, his dream of an alliance uh, that, that would somehow sap the strength of the United States and make the world um, uh, multipolar falls apart in, in, in a kind of, in a, almost, almost comically, in the face of the greatest fact of all, which was that all of this took place, of course, as China rose finally from its, you know, from its, uh, its sleeping status to expand abroad, um, but but he, you know he will have meant something. Jigga, what what do you think about this? I mean, there's a, isn't there an argument that you know for all Chavez's rhetoric and you know talk of revolution that to some extent you know much more sustainable, more fundamental change has been achieved by reformists in Latin America, particularly by Lula and 
you know, the Chilean politicians of the Conciliación since 1990, that there we've seen more bigger shifts in terms of poverty reduction, you know, bigger shifts in terms of building institutions, democratizing society. I think that's a key issue, institutions. What we've seen in Venezuela is a government that after 14 years has systematically undermined democratic institutions and tried to replace them by revolutionary institutions. What we have in the end is just one institution in place, the armed forces, which remains the only institution in Venezuela with the capacity to put pressure on the other political actors to obtain certain outcomes. So that's why the armed forces is so key. Now, back to uh, Chavez. Uh, I think what the success of President Chavez was that he had the talent of keeping the hope for a revolution to come alive. Mm. A revolution that never came in the end. After 14 years, we're still waiting for the revolution. Everybody wants to dream, everyone wants to believe. You go everywhere, Chavez, you know, there's a revolution going on in Venezuela, and you want to say, yes, it's a revolution. You know, we're really tackling inequalities, we're really dealing with poverty. Uh, issues, yes, it's a real revolution going on in Venezuela. But no, it's not true. The revolution has not come to Venezuela. And one of the key differences between Lula and Chavez is the fact that Lula managed to strengthen institutions, democratic institutions. He managed to introduce social inclusion programs like uh, Bolsa Familia, which were sustainable, by at the same time promoting Brazilian business abroad. You see in Venezuela, we have all the rich. You see all around, you, you know, uh, Brazil has you know, empowered local business, and uh, Brazil has managed to create a, a very successful model of, social, uh, of economic growth with social inclusion. Now, you don't see that in Venezuela, unfortunately, because Venezuela, clearly, las misiones have been effective in the way that they have allocated massive funds to deal with particular issues. However, they're not sustainable. If the oil barrel goes within the price, uh, the, uh, the break uh, even price of $80, then you, know, you will not be able to fund these social inclusion policies. So I think in the end, what we're going to see, uh, same with uh, Brazil, uh, bef uh, sorry, uh, in Chile with Concertación, these were sustainable social inclusion policies that were introduced. Now, what we're going to see in Venezuela, unfortunately, is a legacy of a man who came who generated big hopes of change, of bringing a, a, a revolution, uh, of really tackling those issues in Venezuela, but which in the end, you know, failed to, you know, really uh, <laughs> tackle those things. And he failed to tackle corruption. Venezuela has become the most corrupt country in the Latin American region, according to Transparency International. We were talking about the situation of insecurity. 1998, murder rates in Venezuela were 24 murders per every 100,000 inhabitants. Currently, the official rate is 50 murders per every 100,000 inhabitants, so doubled. And these are the official rates. And I think uh, uh, NGOs like uh, the Observatorio Venezolano de Violencia put it at 75, which means they have tripled, which I think you referred uh, in, uh, in your article, I think you also referred in your book. So, yes. Uh, so, so, Rory, is, is, is the revolution in Venezuela an illusion, one of Chavez's illusions? Uh, to, a to some extent, it, it's real, if in a very subjective, um, impressionistic sense. It's, I mean, a lot of people have um, inculcated it in, in their hearts in Venezuela. A lot of ordinary Venezuelans feel that there is a revolution. Uh, they feel empowered by, by this government. Um, and therefore, in that sense, it's real, because for them, it's, it's real in their hearts. So, I mean, and that has value. Um, and I mean, I could, you know, just offer lots of anecdotes about people who just feel that they, you know, now they finally have dignity and that the issue of poverty is center stage and that they no longer need to feel apologetic for, you know, not, for the way that, you know, for, the, you know, for being kind of dark or not speaking great Spanish. And, you know, that's, that's, that's great, you know. And I mean, how, you know, long-term effect or how can you quantify that? No idea, but that certainly has value. And I suspect there will be uh, a rump of Chavismo will, will, will long out, out, uh, outlive him, just as you know, Peronism uh, has in Argentina. Now, how, in what form that, that rump of Chavismo will, will, will take, uh, um, no idea. I mean, so many factions and possibilities. But I think even in 10, 20 years' time, there will still be you know, self-declared Chavistas uh, in, in Venezuela. I think another long-term legacy, uh, um, 
in some ways it may be a positive one uh, of Hugo Chavez is like he did embolden uh, the likes of Evo Morales and Rafael Correa and these guys to um, to, to do things and, and in many ways they're they're proving smarter than him in terms of just they're a bit more pragmatic they're more focused on actually delivering governance and um, and you know and so in that sense the pupils have uh, outgrown the master um, and that's also one of the kind of the tragedies of, of Chavez because he had all this money and skill and yet it was he squandered it but the pupils are, are doing a better job so far um, and so you know, I, I don't know if we can we still tell after the French Revolution. I mean, it, you know, has it worked or not? I mean, in Venezuela, I think it's the, the, it, it was hollow, but there there will be some sort of rump uh, for decades to come. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, the one about the what will happen after Chavez dies. Well, about the opposition. Well, uh, I think the, the key thing would be just to stay. Uh, I guess, you know, stay united around one leader. Um, they'll probably still lose if the election's within the next two months, but at least the, the, the first precondition is, is unity. Um, as to the other question about what, journalistically, what will happen after Chavez, uh, the answer is, uh, story-wise, it'll go over a cliff. Uh, editors are gonna lose interest, um, not straight away. I mean, we want the, you know, the funeral, the elections, you know, a bit of curiosity, like what happens next. But I think beyond that, uh, I'd imagine it's just gonna, um, just, just by, like in Italy, when Berlusconi is not in power, the interest in Italy is, is much diminished. <laughs> Alas. So. I'd just like to take issue with the uh, focus on the armed forces and the diminution of what I understand is a huge expansion of democratic institutions. I've not been there 14 times like John Anderson. I've only been there twice. Um, but one of the things that really impressed me um, when I uh, visiting the barrios was the huge, I mean, Rory's mentioned the sense of dignity and the sense of empowerment. Um, there's a huge expand, nobody's mentioned communal councils. And there has been a very brave expansion of communal councils. Um, 40,000 communal councils have been established with a large amount of resources passed down to local people to be able to prioritize what they think. Um, needs doing in their neighborhoods, and I've seen what they've achieved. You know, they've very simple things like rubbish chutes, which get the rubbish, the, the vehicles are too big to come up to the barriers, so they're metal rubbish chutes which go down and take all the rubbish out. Um, they've, you know, they've built bridges across streams so the kids can get to school. The whole um, literacy um, campaign, which is, you know, in, it's, it's a country free of liter illiteracy now, um, and I just think there's been a huge um, enfranchisement of people as well. The number of people registered to vote has increased over the, since 98, um, from 11 million to 19 million today. And the rate of, pe of adults who are not enfranchised has gone down from 20% to 3%. They are parts of democracy, and I think they shouldn't be overlooked. Um, so the campaign against illiteracy and also Operation Miracle, nobody's mentioned. The wonderful cooperative combination between Venezuela and Cuba, where one and a half million people have had their sight restored in the region. Um, and, you know, Venezuela's paid for the uh, flights for people to go to Havana and have their eye operations there. A wonderful creative kind of foreign policy which is being expanded and it's inspirational to me. And I feel a lot of... You know, I don't deny the problems with security and prisons and corruption, but there is another side of it which I feel has been overlooked today. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I, my question is noting that the, the, when the gentleman made his comment about the Guardia Nacional and the allegations of massive scale drug trafficking, that that was made by a gentleman who's just come back from Mali, I understand, if I've got that right. Uh, most interesting. Um, do you think any um, criminal, narco, political, military access, access uh, largely based, of course, around the drugs trade, not per perhaps entirely that, would... Um, essentially survive a change of government? Is it too entrenched to um, be heavily reduced, damaged under any new government? Uh, I, I would just also point out that I understand that Venezuela was the first country 
to formally remove itself from the Kimberley process, which uh, I think is not unconnected. Hello. Um, well, possibly one of the um, legacies of, uh, of the Chavez era, if we if we could call it that, would be um, the extreme uh, polarization in society, both socially and politically. Uh, do you think it's likely to intensify um, in the near future? Um, I, would like to, I would like to ask uh, if you think that uh, the unions, because Chavez is, uh, always had a very uh, a policy, very uh, ended with uh, strong confrontation with the unions, even the union leader who were Chavista in 1998, lots of them became anti-Chavez in uh, 2000, 2001, 2002, and uh, even uh, great uh, uh, union leader who defended Chavez during uh, uh, 2002 and 2004, uh, like Orlando Chirino, became opponent to, to Chavez and now are really uh, militant against uh, the revolution and the big uh, disillusionment that created uh, between workers. Do you think that workers will uh, will have a role, and uh, syndicalized workers will have a will have a war that will have a, in the in the next few years? So, so can we t can we can we take those questions now? I mean, I think we should actually someone I'm not sure who should answer the question about the extension of grassroots democracy through communal councils, and the question about the traditional trade unions and their position in. Venezuela now, where these because these are you know these this is the classic in, this is the, the classic institute these are institutions new and old institutions. Where do we stand? Um, do does communal democracy work, Rory? You've been you've been there okay. for six years. You've seen it. Well, okay. Well, we can just first briefly talk about well, the the trade union question. Um, I think the trade unions are obviously a lot weaker now, largely because Ciudad Guayana, the industrial heartland, which is where the, the unions were really really strong. <coughs> Um, is itself is, is, is a husk. I mean, most of those factories are now operating at almost half capacity. Um, and it's, it's almost like a, a civil war and in terms of or the Wild West in, in terms of the security and the infighting in these unions. Um, and I mean, occasionally some, and for me, I, you know, it's always quite telling, like the, there was a trade union leader I interviewed called Ruben Gonzalez. And he's a very left-wing guy and, you know, he's a Chavista. Um, but when the government was had issues with the trade union. Well, he basically, he, long story short, he, he went, they jailed him because he'd organized a strike because he complained his workers weren't getting paid properly. So they sent him to jail for 17 months um, and interviewed him shortly after he came out. Um, and by then, of course, he's sort of a, a, a hostile to the government, but he says, I'm still Chavista. And, yeah, well, I think, yeah, he was still adopting the label. So, I mean, but to your, your question, yes, the unions will, are still p powerful, but far lesser than before because <coughs> now there's, they're, they're po politicized. There's the pro-Chavez unions and anti-Chavez unions, and just the industrial base of Venezuela is now so diminished that, as a result, the, the unions are diminished. So I think, yes, it will have a role, but far less important than, say, 10 or 20 years ago, unfortunately, because they could have been a wonderful or an important um, you know, in ingredient in, in, in civic society. In terms of the, the other question about um, the, 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 the consejos comunales, I mean, that again was also probably the best, after some of the social programs, that was one of the potential best innovations of, of Chavez. And in theory, it's a great idea. Um, and some of them work wonderfully. I mean, I've seen some as well, and they do really work. You know, these neighborhood councils, and people feel empowered, and it's kind of the grassroots in action. And you can see, like, some of the petro state money is actually getting to them, and they're tackling local problems. And it's great. Um, but the problem is just it was never, again, the follow through. And it seemed to me like the, you know, the positive stories there were kind of quite sporadic. And there was no proper kind of, uh, it was never properly kind of institutionalized or, or made as a sustainable system, alas, because it's a good idea. And, and, I, and I got a horrible feeling that they will not outlive Hugo Chavez. That they are not sustainable and dependent largely on oil wealth. No, because he made them. I mean, one of his he, he made sure that the, the the money to the communal councils basically came directly from the palace, 
So his idea was, you know, local councils, but also kind of to bypass the mayors and prevent regional governors. He never liked them, even his own guys. So I mean, he, in this way, he had a direct connection to the people, but also he had kind of he was controlling the purse strings. But it was a genuine grassroots initiative as well. So, but I think once he he, he goes, um, I I suspect whoever follows. Uh, will not have the same passion as, as he did um, for for the, uh, those councils, and I think that will, you know, some of the, the few kind of good things, if you like, that uh, that he's left will, will well could wither pretty quickly. What about the drugs trade? Is that a is that a, an institution that can survive survive, Chavez? Um, <clears throat> you know, who knows? Um, you know, one of, one of the in, in his breaking away uh, of ties with the United States. Uh, Chavez also ceased to cooperate with the uh, the DEA um, for you know for political reasons. So there hasn't been, um, as there are in some of the other countries that export drugs, you know, informally. I'm not accusing. Uh, I'm not suggesting that there was a policy of state to make Venezuela a transshipment point for drugs. But you know, all the all the evidence is that. In fact, it has, as, as has happened in other Latin American states, including northeastern Brazil. You know, the, the route to <coughs> Europe for a, uh, for drugs uh, is via West Africa nowadays, and, and, and there have been Venezuelan and Colombian planes that have landed and, and made deals with, with the militaries in those fragile West African states as a, as a means of getting the drugs to Europe. Part of the problem is a lack of, a lack of uh, vigilance or follow through or ability to uh, control uh, uh, these these military and paramilitary forces who control vast tracts of wilderness um, with airstrips, uh, you know, as, as as seems to be the case in Venezuela, you know, as previously. I mean, not to lump it, and this is not an ideological thing at all, because of course the same thing happened. And it happened under the U.S.'s uh, aegis in Central America at the time of the Contra Wars. You know, uh, Pablo Escobar used the very same uh, sort of rat lines and, and routes that the CIA had opened up to get arms to the Contras in Nicaragua to bounce drugs through Costa Rica, Honduras, and so on via pliant militaries, corrupted militaries to the United States in that time. And um, the same thing is happening uh, apparently today. Point, the point being, merely uh, that I think that this is one of the submerged problems that has yet to come uh, to to be harnessed or to be truly dealt with. And you know, it happens whenever you have uh, you know inattention, a kind of black area, a kind of a kind of area where the state doesn't exercise effective control, or perhaps believes too much in its minions, uh, takes at face value their their honesty. Uh, and moral integrity, um, you know, that, that's uh, it's, 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 a, it's a problem I can't go into too much detail in because I don't have it, but it seems to be a real issue, and particularly an issue again, for my friends on what could be regarded the Venezuela's ultra left, um, with whom I spent quite a bit of time on this last trip in November and December, who told me. That their greatest enemy, that their greatest fears, and their greatest the greatest risk they felt uh, to Venezuela, to the revolution, and so on, came from the National Guard, um, uh, which was, you know, organized crime Inc. Um, that doesn't mean to say that Chavismo is, but that means to say that there is a kind of element within the country that hasn't been. That hasn't been policed properly. That hasn't. That's out of control, and it's part of this amorphous, submerged mess of uh, uh, competing influences and trafficking and all the rest of it. That's, um, that's been allowed to flourish um, in Venezuela under underneath all the rhetoric. You know, uh, this is not this is not Switzerland, or maybe it is. Uh, <laughs> just a little more. I think we've um, we've got to finish there. Um, thanks very much to all the panelists and to the audience. Thank you.